So we've come to chapter 2 of Romans this morning. And before I read through this chapter, Lord willing, we'll, we'll try and take it in one go. A very brief recap of what we looked at in the first chapter. And we saw a, a kind of introduction in the, the first half of the first chapter. And um, we saw a little bit about Paul himself and his desire to actually visit the saints in Rome and, and be with them in person. Um, and also to see, really, as you come to the end of that first half, the theme of the whole letter, this gospel and it being the power for salvation to everyone who believes, Jew, Greek, for any in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And I think I mentioned it was either last week or the week before. Really, from then on up to sort of chapter three and halfway through chapter three, before, get, before Paul gets into um, the remedy that Jesus has given in the Saviour himself and the works that he has accomplished, Paul is convincing the reader of our need for a Saviour in the first place. And so he works through the, the fall of man and how mankind, um, yeah, in a sense, moved away from God, from the acknowledgement of God himself, um, how depravity grew and left things in a, in a pretty sorry state really by the time you get to the end of chapter 1. So as we come into chapter 2, we'll see really throughout this chapter that God is a judge and he is a fair judge and he will judge righteously. Um, and we'll bring that and a few things more out of the chapter as we go through it. So to get the full picture, let's just read through it together first. So Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Therefore, you are without excuse, every man of you who passes judgment. For in that you judge one another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfish, ambitious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the jew first and also of the greek but glory and honor and peace to every man who does good to the jew first and also to the greek for there is no partiality with god for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when... According to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law 
and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish and a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who have bought idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. For indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law, but if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. If therefore uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you, who though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Right. I don't know about you. But it's not the kind of chapter that you can just read through once and think, yeah, I understand that, (laughs) because I certainly didn't. And it's, I mean, as, as often as people preach from the book of Romans, I don't think it's too often that people really preach from chapter two. And I think one of the difficulties with it is there's particularly, in my mind at least, there's particularly a couple of verses that can seem to seem to contradict things that Scripture says in other places. So, taken out of context, and if we forget the framework of foundational truths of Scripture that we already know, we could take some of these verses the wrong way. So, sometimes what we have to do is a little bit of study and have a look at what other scriptures say about things to make sure that we are interpreting this right. And as it may be seeming like a... not so much an intellectual exercise, because I'm not saying anybody would necessarily see it as that way. But... I know I've said it before, I cannot stress or over-exaggerate the importance of rightly interpreting the Bible. Because it's that that comes first. We can read and read and read and read. But unless we understand how to interpret the Bible properly, then what we're reading is going to do us no good and can actually do harm. Because there is only one way to correctly interpret the Bible. There might be lots of ways out there, but that doesn't validate the fact that there's lots of ways out there. There is only one correct way. There's only one correct interpretation. There might be numerous applications to what we're reading, but there is only one correct interpretation. And so this idea that we should do away with doctrine because doctrine divides, it's not what we find the Bible saying at all. And so... When we come to a passage like this, some of these verses can be used to teach that we're saved by works. Or we're saved by grace through faith and we maintain our salvation by keeping up with good works. And if those good works are not there continually, then we were never really saved to begin with. That's becoming a more and more popular teaching in the church. So it's imperative that we understand this properly. Not just for our own sake, but for the sake of others. I'm sure like yourselves... I've had a number of conversations with people that have been fearful unnecessarily that they could lose their salvation or that they'd lost it because of things that they'd been taught in the church that were incorrectly interpreted. 
And I think more than anything as well, this is, it is serious because if false interpretation continues, eventually where it all leads is to presenting God in a way that is not true. The correct understanding of seeing God in his true light as he has presented himself in the scripture is skewed and he's often brought down to man's level. He can be made into a tyrant and I think really that is the biggest tragedy of misinterpreting the scriptures is it changes who God is. And people, I'm sure you've heard it said, we, we become like whoever or whatever we worship. And if we develop a false image of who God is, it dishonours him, but it will have consequences for us as well. So it is important. Now, as we start this chapter, what we've got here, I'm sure you've heard some people describe this first group of people as moralists. Moralists. And what they would mean by that is people that have are in agreement with the condemnation that has just been before it in the first chapter. So all that was said about how bad and how depraved mankind is, um, rejecting God, haters of God, insolent, boastful, disobedient, murdering, all those kinds of things. And you've got the people that will say, yeah, about those people are terrible, absolutely terrible. I'd never do any of those kinds of things. But, he says, what about you who practice such things? And we know that there are people who seemingly live a good life on the surface. They've never been to prison. Kids are well behaved and got manners. Don't throw the food around at tea time. <laughs> things like that. But, what did Jesus say? Back in Matthew 5, 6, chapters like that. We only see a man's face. We don't see his heart. God judges the heart. We read a little bit further on in the chapter. That one day, according to my gospel, Jesus will judge the secrets of men. Jesus said, you've heard it written, don't commit adultery. But if you lust after a woman, you are committing adultery. You hate somebody. It's like committing murder. The heart of somebody who hates, or the heart of somebody who would commit murder if they were given a chance and knew they could get away with it, is exactly the same heart as somebody who has committed murder. The heart is the same. Often it's only <laughs> opportunity or somebody just not bothered whether they get caught or not that makes a difference between someone who has committed murder and somebody who hasn't God sees the heart God judges the heart and so because somebody might look like they're a decent person on the outside it's not how God sees things and so for people to condemn others because they're leading a decent life or a more moral looking life it's hypocritical. And what is being said here, that those people will not escape the judgment of God either. Just because they're in agreement that all these things are wrong, doesn't make a difference when they have not had the experience of regeneration, which is the only way anybody can be saved. And we move on to this in the next chapter. So... One thing I'd like to point out before we do move on, which I think will help with some of these verses, we are not dealing with, in this chapter, we are not yet being taught from God what it is to be saved. We are not yet being taught about the free gift of eternal life. What we are talking about is God is going to judge everybody by their deeds, impartially, Jew or Gentile. And so the people who look like they are living a decent moral life, if they've not been born again, they are going to come under the same judgment. Their deeds might not be as openly wicked as some, but 
the thoughts and the intentions of their hearts, I'm sure they wouldn't want laid out for everybody to see. I don't think anybody would. And as we come on to verse 4, these people who it appears to be saying think that they might be able to work their way to heaven based on how good they think they are. Verse 4, it says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of the kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. These people are unrepentant. Now, a word has to be said about that. You'll often hear it taught that the word repent means to be sorrowful, to turn your back on your sins, to make a commitment to follow God every day for the rest of your life and all of this kind of thing. Those things are obviously not bad things. But those are works. Repentance, in the literal meaning of the Greek word metanoia, means a change of mind. Even in our English word repent, pent meaning to think, re again, it means to think again. It's to change your mind about something. And in the sense of belief, and this again, this is very important to understand, in the sense of what we need to do to be saved we need to change our minds about the fact that Jesus is the only one who can save us and nothing we can do in and of ourselves can save us we need to think again about who Jesus is and all that he has done and put all our trust in him it's not about being sorry for our sins again that is not a bad thing but if we are saved by being sorry for our sins how on earth do you quantify that how sorry do you have to be how long do you have to mourn? And then you look back in years' time and start questioning your salvation because you start thinking, well, was I really sorry enough? How sorry was I because I've just committed that sin again that I was sorry for way back then? In biblical terms, the word repent is synonymous with belief. John's Gospel, I know I'm slightly moving away from the passage here, but it's important that we remember this word repentance because it's the only time the word repent occurs in this letter, which might come as a bit of a surprise to us. In this letter to the Romans, the word repent appears once, and this is the only place, so this is my opportunity to talk about it a little bit. John's Gospel was written. John tells us why he wrote the Gospel at the end of it in chapter 20, verse 31. He says, these things were written that you may believe that Jesus Christ, sorry, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you will have life in his name. So we know that John's gospel was written for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. We know from what he says that we can be saved just by reading John's gospel. John's Gospel has no word of repentance throughout it. The word repent never appears in John's Gospel. But believe is all the way through it. Believe is all the way through it. Romans has the word repent once. But believe and faith is all the way through it. When we put these things together, we can understand that it's true. It's right what it says, that when the Bible talks about repent... To put our faith in the Lord, it means to change our minds. Again, it's not wrong to be sorrowful and feel remorse and regret about our sins. That's good and healthy, but we are not saved by that. I'll tell you something else. We're not even saved by faith. We're saved by grace. We read the scriptures carefully. We are saved by grace alone through faith. The faith is just the means by which we receive that gift of salvation, that we receive God's grace. That's what it says in Ephesians 2.8. You're saved by grace through faith. It's all of God. It's all from him. And the repentance 
when we do see that word in the Bible, when it's connected with receiving eternal life, it means change what you believe. Change the fact that before you have not wanted to receive Jesus Christ, the Saviour, and receive or believe all that he is and all that he has said. It's that change of mind. And it's there time and time again throughout Scripture, and we'll see it as we go through this letter. And the fact that judgment doesn't come instantly upon people who have not repented is because of God's kindness and patience. This is what it says here in verse 4. It's a beautiful verse, really, verse 4. These things are described as God's riches. The riches of his kindness and his forbearance and patience, knowing that it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. God is patient. God doesn't just see somebody in, in the state that they're in and cut them down straight away. Even when we, you read about the, the woman Jezebel, um, is it in the letter to Thyatira in Revelation? I've given her time to repent, but she hasn't. Let's just turn to 2 Peter in chapter 3. And again, when we're speaking with people that we know have not yet come to the Lord in faith, and sometimes it can be disheartening, sometimes it can be frustrating, but to remember the Lord's heart full of kindness and patience towards people who have not yet come to him. In Peter's second letter, and in chapter 3, and in verse 3, it says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come, with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? This is speaking of the return of Jesus. Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And maybe we could include some of the moralists that we've read about in, in Romans. And then in verse 5 it says, For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice, that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth by his word are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. We've just read about that. Verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slow, but is patient towards you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is why the Lord did not bring judgment straight away. Even, even for ourselves, the Lord always gives opportunity. Think back to Cain. God knew what Cain was plotting in his heart to murder his brother, but gave him warning, tried to encourage him. God is patient, and it's that patient and kindness which is leading people to repentance. He doesn't force people to it, but he gives time and he gives opportunity. Now, as we see these things and we read these verses, it gives me an opportunity to mention again something that I think is worthwhile mentioning because of the, the, the prevalence in the so-called evangelical church of Calvinistic doctrines sweeping throughout Christendom and it's been growing and growing over the years now essentially what Calvinism teaches is the opposite of what we've just read here in this verse it teaches that nobody has the ability to understand or receive the gospel so God has to zap them and make them believe but God will only do that for a limited amount of people this is, and because of that they conclude that Jesus only died for a limited amount of people. And the rest, God never gives the ability to believe or understand the gospel, and they are confined to an eternal existence in hell forever. That's just how he's made them, and there's nothing that they can do about it. 
It's in the London Baptist Confession of Faith. It's in the Westminster Confession. Now, again, the reason I'm saying this is because of how, how much ground these diabolical doctrines are gaining in the evangelical church. But the Bible clearly says God died, Jesus died for all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God is merciful and patient to all. And his kindness and his patience leading people to repentance for everybody. How can it be a valid accusation in verse 5 that people being stubborn and unrepentant of heart are storing up wrath for themselves? If that's how God's made them and there's nothing they can do about it. What does it mean in verse 4 that God's kind and patient leading people to repentance if they've never got the ability to believe. It's contradictory to what scriptures plainly say. Now when we look at verses 4 and 5, notice the contrast. God has a treasury. God has a storehouse. And contained in it is things like this patience and this kindness towards mankind. But what does man store up? Man stores up wrath for himself in verse 5. By rejecting God's treasure for man, all the things from a loving heart, from a loving God, instead of that, by rejecting God's kindness and God's mercy and God's salvation, mankind stores up wrath for himself on the day of judgment. It's, it's such, a, um, such a distinction, such a contrast, that it seems almost unfathomable as to why people would do that. God is holding out all of these things, and yet man refuses it and instead stores up wrath as more and more time goes on. And it says in verse 6, God who will render to every man according to his deeds. Everybody is going to be judged. Now believers will stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Every Christian will stand before Christ, but it's not to have our salvation or our eternal life judged. It's our works that will be judged, what we've done or what we've not done with what God has given us. He has given us things in this life to be faithful with. And when we stand before the beamer seat of Christ, it's our works that we will be judged. We will not be judged. Our works will. And these things are to motivate us and inspire us and encourage us out of a love for him to work. But there is another judgment seat. There are two judgment thrones. The other one is what the Bible calls the great white throne of judgment. And that is where unbelievers will appear and will have their works judged. They've already been condemned because of their rejection of the only way to eternal life, because of their rejection of Christ. And at the great white throne of judgment after the millennial kingdom is where unbelievers' deeds will be judged. And essentially, this is so much of what this passage is saying, that God will judge everybody's works. Now, when we come on to verse 7... This is where things get a little bit more tricky. In verse 7, let me just go back and read verse 6 again. God who will render to every man according to his deeds, to those who by persevering in doing good, seek for glory and honour and immortality, eternal life. Could this be saying that actually we receive eternal life by doing good deeds and by persevering and seeking for glory and honour? No. Because we know in the clearest of clear scriptures that the Bible says salvation, eternal life, is a free gift. We receive the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ as a free gift. It's not of works so that no man may boast. We can't buy it. We can't earn it. We can't lift a finger to do anything to be saved other than just receive it in faith as a free gift. So what is this saying? The most common interpretation of this is, is that P 
people who are saved, people who are believers, will be recognized by good deeds and perseverance and seeking after glory and honor. But that is not what it says. That is not what this scripture is saying. It is saying that people's deeds will be judged by God to those who persevere in doing good, seek for the glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. Now what I will say to you and what I will say to myself, even as a believer, I am seeking after eternal life. I am looking forward to it. It's not like I'm trying to find it because I don't have it. Or you're trying to find it because you don't have it. But we are still seeking all that is yet to come. We shall be living our lives in view of the eternal life and the salvation that is still to be brought to us. It says seek, not work for. Not look for something in terms of finding something that you don't already have. Now Paul in Philippians chapter 3 says something very much to this effect. Now again, you remember all that Paul taught. Paul knew that he was safe in Christ. He was eternally secure. But when Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 3, he says in verse 10, Philippians 3 and verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Verse 13, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was seeking that eternal life, that salvation that was still to be brought to him. Peter, in his first letter, Wrote, and this is a real, real encouraging passage. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Therefore, gird your minds for action, keeping sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've already received that grace. We've already been saved by it. But there is more to come. The fulfillment of these things is still to come. And for those that are seeking this, those that are seeking the honour and glory and the things that accompany eternal life, deeds will be judged. Just like we've seen. As well as that, in verse 8, those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. Their deeds will be judged. God will judge righteously and impartially as we come through. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also the Greek. God is impartial. Why does it say the Jew first and then also to the Greek? Because of the privileges that were given to the nation of Israel. And as you go through and read in the letter to the Romans, you will see things like when you get to chapter 9, that theirs is the adoption of sons, theirs is the scriptures, theirs was the law. Even Jesus himself came in the flesh as a Jew. They have all these privileges, therefore they have a greater degree of responsibility. This is why it's to the Jew first and then the Greek. But there is no partiality with God. And then as we see, as we come through the next couple of verses, that whether somebody is under the law, being a Jew, or whether somebody is not under the law, being a Gentile, everybody has sinned and will be judged as we've seen. Now, 
Verse 13 is another difficult verse. And it's not a shameful thing to admit it. Peter wrote about some of the things that Paul writes. When Peter wrote and said, some of the things Paul wrote is difficult to understand. Now, it says in verse 13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So what does that mean? We know that by keeping the law we're not saved. The very next chapter makes it clear. In chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So how can it say in verse 13, the doers of the law will be justified? Chapter 3, verse 20 says, no flesh will be justified. And then at the end of chapter 3, in verse 28, it says, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is why it's a little bit difficult. <laughs> Again, very important for us to understand and it's good you know we we need our faith to be strengthened we need our assurance to be solid in the fact that we are children of God and that can never change our salvation is assured and we come across passages like this and maybe hear or remember things that people have said that yeah well you you, you might be saved as a free gift but you've got to keep going in the faith to to maintain that salvation if my salvation is dependent on my ongoing performance, I'm not too assured about that, you know what I mean? But God wants us to be assured, and we come across a passage like this. It does us good to just take a bit of time to fi- try and find out what this is saying. Now again, to remember the context of the letter so far, Paul is not teaching about salvation yet. He is not teaching about what Christ has done for these people to save us so he's not dealing with that secondly justification and justify does not always mean in the salvific sense in the sense of being justified to salvation and eternal life and we have examples of it in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and I believe it's verse 1 In Deuteronomy 25, verse 1, it says, If there is a dispute between men, and this is, this is again dealing with the law, the Mosaic law. If there is a dispute between men and they go to court and the judges decide their case and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be the wicked man deserves to be beaten. We know this is not talking about justification to salvation or eternal life. This is justification as in being justified as in being innocent or right according to the law or this particular law that was given does that make sense this is an example where justification is not for eternal life this is in right standing to this particular law speaks in psalm 51 about god himself being justified now, God don't need to be justified for eternal life, does he? It goes without saying. And it's actually quoted in the next chapter in Romans. In Romans 3, verse 4. May it never be. Rather, let God be found to be true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, and then he quotes from Psalm 51, that thou mayest be justified in thy words and might prevail when thou art judged. It's just talking about simply being right, being innocent in regards to a certain matter. So in this context, verse 13 in this context is saying that whether somebody's under the law or whether somebody's not under the law, don't make a difference, it's what they do. The law saves nobody, like we've just read from those passages in... in um, in Romans chapter 3. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, it's important that we understand this. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. In 
Again, Paul wrote, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. If somebody doesn't abide by every single law that was written, that was given to Moses, they break them all. And this is why, in some senses, the law was seen as a curse. You've got to keep them all, even if you don't study them. The law, Stuart talked about it a bit earlier this morning. The law saved nobody. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. The law was given to highlight man's sin, to show God's standard of holiness, and in comparison, our inability to keep the law, and so from that, our need for a saviour. That's what the law really does. It shows who God is, it shows who we are, and shows that we, we need a saviour. When Moses came down from Sinai with the law that he was given, 613 commandments, that's a lot. No, you can't even remember them, let alone do them all. What else did he come down with? He came down with the instructions and the design for the tabernacle and the priestly system, the means of atonement. God knew Israel weren't going to be able to keep the law, so he gave them the tabernacle and the priestly system and the whole sacrificial operations so that by the shedding of blood, Israel's sins would be atoned for. It wasn't the blood of the goats and the, the oxen that, that, that took away the sins because they were showing that one day a Messiah would come and it would be his blood that would take away the sins. The sins were covered for the time being. So you understand this is what essentially, there's more to it than this, but that was what the law was for. No, no one could keep it, but God provided the means of salvation. And so... It is not talking in this passage that anybody is justified by the law. Jew or Gentile, what it's saying is, especially to the Jews now, because we're coming on to them speaking to the Jews, whether you're circumcised or not, whether you've got the law or not, don't matter one bit. It's what you do. And it's not just what you do. It's what you think. Verse 15 speaks about the conscience. Everybody has been given a conscience. And on the day that conscience will testify to God. Everybody who stands before God. The conscience will testify in the sense that they knew what was right and wrong. We already read that in chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verse 32. And although they know the ordinance of God... They still did all them wrong things. So our conscience will bear witness, accusing and defending. And God will judge, in verse 16, the secrets of men through Christ. So it's not just what people do, the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And again, this is where we're so in need of God's mercy and grace and patience. Because again, although not just unsafe people but I'm sure if we were honest and examined ourselves and was truthful with ourselves you wouldn't want everything you've ever fought or maybe even just fought this last week projected on a great big screen for everybody to see I think the seats had empty pretty quick same for all of us so again it's, it stops us from adopting the character hopefully anyway Stops us from adopting the character of the moralist that we've just been looking at. Essentially, we're all the same without the blood of Christ. You know, we're all the same regardless of what we do or what we don't do. And so, as we come into the next section of the chapter, he is now speaking specifically to the Jews. It's there in verse 17. When you see the name Jew, it's always Jew, it never means anything different. And he's saying that the Jews boast in God, they've got the law, they know his will, approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, a confidence that they teach the blind, 
a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, teacher of the immature, have the law and the embodiment of the truth. This was true of Israel, and they thought were, they, were, they were so great to be able to teach and show the Gentiles the way and all these things which they failed in. But I would put it to you, is the church really much different? I don't think there's anything in that list that also can't be claimed by the church. We, we, or, or should be claimed by the church that we know is will. We're instructed out of the law. We're not under the law, but we can still be instructed by the things of it. A guide to the blind, a light, a correctors, teachers, have the law, the embodiment of the truth. These are all things that the church should, should have and should be um, operating through. But we do this. Now, what kind of example was Israel to the nations? Well, not much really. There was even times where God said in Ezekiel to Judah, you're actually worse than the nations. Now, so much again of this is in light of the light that somebody has given or the light that Israel has given or the light that the church is given. We know God. We're in relationship with him. Like Stuart was saying earlier this morning, every true believer has been united in spirit with God. We have his word. We've got each other, Lord willing. And so our witness to the world carries with it great weight and great responsibility. Now, as you read through the passage and get to verse 24, he says, because of really what he's saying is because of your witness and your hypocrisy and the things that you don't do because of your should, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of what you are doing or what you're not doing. And again, it's so sad to say, but the same thing happens with the church time and time again. You see examples of all this stuff that come out about Ravi Zacharias a few months ago. The media get, gets hold of that. If you don't know who the man is, he was a man, he had a very, very well-known ministry, travelled all over the world. Turns out, he was in some very serious sexual sin for a long time. And the media get, gets hold of it, splashes all over the world, and the world looks at it, and the church just looks like a laughing stock. And it happens time and time again. You see it with money preachers. You see it with fake healers and all these kinds of things. But for those who are, by the grace of God, trying to be led by him, trying to live by the light of his word. It makes our witness all the more important because the world is never going to see the church at large in a good light. But your life and my life and our example as a small fellowship will speak volumes to those who are watching and people are watching. As soon as you stick your head up out of the parapet and call yourself to be a Christian, you're scrutinised. Ten times more than anybody else. And so is the church. And so it is imperative as we carry the name of Christ, as we are supposed to be ambassadors of the name of Christ, that we live a life that is pleasing to him. Because if we're doing that, then even if people want to say bad things, they can't judge us for the things that we are doing that are wrong. They might not like what we're doing or what we're saying. But they can't point a finger in the sense of the way dragging the name of Christ through the dirt. Our witness is so important. It really is. In a world that needs light now more than ever. It's a witness. It's a witness when people come through that door. It's a witness when people are with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Truly is, I, I shudder to think, because I know it's, it's possible for any one of us that I could ever have that said against me. And it may have been, it may have been a justified statement at times that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Do you know, it also works the other way around as well, in a sense. And we'll come on to it later in the book. That as a church, as a Christian church, 
we're supposed to be a witness to the Jews as well, who were originally given these scriptures, but have not accepted the Messiah. The church is supposed to be um, a means and an instrument that the Lord uses to bring Israel to jealousy because of our witness, because of our knowledge of their scriptures, as the Bible puts it. But that's for later. Right, we're finishing. So again, the last, the last three, four verses speaks of this issue of circumcision. Circumcision was a, a, a rite, if you like, a, 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 a ritual in a sense that was first given to Abraham and his descendants. I'm sure you're aware of the, the, the basis of this. Now, Abraham was declared righteous through faith in Genesis 15 before he was circumcised. God made a covenant with Abraham before he was circumcised. He believed in God and it was credited to him for righteousness before he was circumcised. He is the father of all who are of faith, whether Jew or Gentile, whether a physical descendant or not a physical descendant. And when we read these verses, again, essentially what it is saying, that, that somebody who's circumcised means nothing if they're not keeping the law. It's just the outward act. Again, like similar to a moralist or anybody who could be sat in a church on a Sunday morning who hasn't really come into right relationship with God, who hasn't really believed in him, but thinks that by, um, by church attendance, by the fact that they were confirmed when they were a child, or they've got a cross tattooed on their arm, or what, and anything else that by them, somebody might think that they're saved by, other than by putting faith in God. It's just tradition. It's just ritual. None of those things matter. And God is saying here that circumcision doesn't matter. It is all about the heart. It's all about the heart. And when he says in verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision which is one outwardly. He's not denying that there is no more Israel or that God no longer has a place or a plan for Israel that will be fulfilled. He is just saying that a, a, a true Jew, a Jew... Jew means praise. And this is something else that the Apostle Paul is doing here in this passage. Jew comes from the root of Judah. It means praise in the Hebrew. This is what it means. The purpose for the Jews was to praise God in the right way. And he's saying that the only person who is truly praising God in the right way is somebody who is in right relationship with him, not just because you've been circumcised or because you're a descendant of Abraham. The Jews believed and taught, especially as you come up to the time of Christ, that you're saved just by the fact that you're a Jew. You're going into the kingdom just because you're a physical descendant of Abraham. And that's why it's so important to be circumcised. You're saved by it. Paul throws that right out of the window. So did Jesus, so did John the Baptist. Doesn't deny the fact that they are Jews and that Israel is still Israel and they still have certain privileges and all the promises for the future hold but in the true sense in the true fulfillment of what a true Jew who praises God in spirit and truth it's not the case just because somebody is circumcised verse 29 and this should speak loud to us verse 29 and we're finishing but he is a Jew and this isn't talking about, again, this isn't talking about Gentile Christians being a Jew. Just because somebody is of the faith doesn't make them a spiritual Jew. No, it's not saying that. Again, it's just speaking about somebody who is a full Jew. Somebody who really has come to real faith in God. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men. You see that word praise there again. His praise is not from men, but from God. It's the circumcision of the heart that God is after. For Jew and for Gentile. What's he saying by the circumcision of the heart? What does he mean there? Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6. Deuteronomy 
He says, moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Notice who's doing it. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul in order that you may live. You see why it's by the Spirit. Back in Romans 2, 29, the circumcision of the heart is by the Spirit. It's not something we can do. It's a work of God himself. And this is what it says here in Deuteronomy. And to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, in order that you may live. The only way anybody can do that is if a work of God takes place within somebody. To stir our hearts up to do that. Circumcision is, in its physical sense, the removal of the flesh. The removal of the flesh. Our old man, our sin nature, was crucified with Christ and buried. It was a work of God. And this is what God wants from the Jews. This is what he always wanted from the Jews. One day God will do it. One day God will do it. It's there in Deuteronomy. But he wants the same from us. He wants the same from everybody. He wants that the person who turns up to church on a Sunday morning and sits there and hears things and thinks it's good and has grown up in a Christian family and has tried to do good all their life, he wants that person to understand that that will accomplish nothing throughout eternity. Just the same as a person who has lived wicked their whole life. They won't end up in the same place. It's only through the circumcision of the heart, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Gentile, it matters nothing. Tradition matters nothing. We've got to allow God to work these things out within our hearts. So, with this chapter, and again, if there's been a little bit of work going on up there and head scratching, something still might not be absolutely clear. Don't worry a thing about it. It's not an easy chapter at all. And there still may be some questions. Don't worry about it. But ask the Lord to impart to us what he would want us to have. Our relationship towards him, our relationship towards each other. And praise him for that he has done, because again, without God circumcising our hearts, that work of the Spirit, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be doing this, we wouldn't know him. We wouldn't have this eternal future to look forward to. This free gift. And as we go through the rest of the letter, these things just grow and develop and come out more and more and more. And there's, uh, yeah, without going on too much, as we come into chapter 3, the next time we come to this letter, we really start to see God stepping in to the condition of the world, the condition of men's lives in a great and powerful way.